the, the situation today is rather like we've entered a new Third World War. But it's a war that's very, very different than World War I and World War II. But at any given moment, in any part of the world, there can be a violent explosion which kills and maims innocent people, you know, and that can happen anywhere. At the same time, there's a form of conventional warfare that's taking place on the ground in the Middle East. And we're also faced with this mass migration of people who are fleeing from uh, war zones and fleeing in terror and completely changing the face of Europe. So I would argue that this problem uh, which faces us is not just a problem for the Middle East, not just a problem for Europe, it's a global problem and has to be seen in that context and to be seen in fact as, as a, a third world war situation. But as far as the Middle East goes, I think the first thing to do and the first step is really to try and get some clear analysis as to why this is happening. What are the root causes? Let me just give a couple of examples. First of all, um, the states that are engaged, the nations that are engaged in conflict, um, in the main were nations created by the colonial powers. They were uh, artificial constructs, if you like, uh, bringing together people from disparate backgrounds, religious, ethnic, social, cultural. Uh, the only way in which they could be held together was by some strong form of central government. In the old days of colonial administration, in latter days, that fell into the hands of a, of a, a person or a group, uh, a dictator. Um, and uh, that was the only way in which these groups really could function. And if you remove a dictator by force, you release forces that you're unable to control because uh, that is exactly what happened in the invasion of Iraq. Now, that doesn't mean to say because you say that, you necessarily have uh, support or are in support of dictatorial rule. What it does say, it, it faces up to the reality of the situation to say that is what happens. And if you're going to bring about change, you can't expect a nation suddenly to uh, adopt a democratic form of government when for generations they've worked in the way that they've worked. How long has it taken this country to have a form of democracy which is by no means ideal? I'd say the first step, really, is to have a very detailed, thorough analysis of the situation to try and understand why. On another example, um, why is it and how is it that many young Muslims are being uh, attracted to this extreme uh, form of, of uh, which is a perversion in my view of Islam. It's a, virtually a death cult. Why is it? What is happening there? Uh, one of the first um, people to be beheaded and is beheading to be shown publicly in this country was a man by the name of uh, Ken Bigley. Um, and Phil Bigley is a good friend of mine. He's now a trustee of Hostage International, uh, which uh, Hostage UK, which I'm a uh, joint founder. And uh, at the time when his brother was uh, in prison and beheaded, he asked me if I would work with the family. So I went to see his mother in Liverpool, which was a little two up and two down. And she was in bed. And I sat on the end of a bed and said, she said to me, she said, you know, nothing can really describe how I feel at this time. To, to lose a son um, in that way, it's just terrible. It's awful. But then she went on to say something which I thought was profoundly moving and significant. She said, but my son, and my grief, rather, my grief, is no different from the grief of a mother who's lost her child as a result of insurgency or warfare in that part of the world. And I think with that one very simple statement, she summed up a fundamental truth that regardless of creed or color or background, we're members of one human family. We don't always behave in a humane way one to another, but somehow the gospel actually emphasizes that point and it says, you know, one of our duties as Christians is to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's a very, very one of the very clear commands. Um, 
We have to try and understand the extremists as well. Let me put it this way. I, again, a, a, another story of um, at a, one of our conferences in Hostage UK, uh, there was a hostage released who faced a death, death penalty. And uh, he was now feeling very depressed because his family was getting no use of his family. And he went to the head of the group said that he was very fed up and very depressed. And the head of the group said, I understand that. He took from his pocket um, a mobile phone, switched it on. There was a picture of a young boy, aged about 12, 14. So that's my son. Then he switched it on and the boy went into video mode. The boy walked towards the target and exploded. He was wearing a, a explosive belt. His father was proud of him. He said, that was my son. Now that will tell you many things, but it will also, it will, one of the things it tells you is that that father, of course, believed that by his son behaving in that way, um, he would presumably gain instant access to whatever paradise awaited him. And it taught me that what you believe radically affects the way in which you behave. Radically. Um, and young people who fall under the influence of charismatic leader because there are no other opportunities for them very often you know the group provides the security the group provides employment as well some of the psychopathic characters who've been committing these acts of brutality on tape they're clearly psychopathic they're not the majority in these groups the majority are made up of of young men young women drawn from areas where there's no opportunity